I am Jim Collison and live from the Gallup Studios here in Omaha, Nebraska. This is Gallup's Call the Coach, recorded on June 18th, 2018. On this special edition of Call the Coach, we'll spend time investigating the experience, emotion, and empirical aspects of each element of Gallup's Q12 engagement instrument and know how to use it to increase the power of our coaching as a primary driver of success. If you have questions during this webcast, we do have a live chat room available for you right below the main video window. Just get down there. If you're watching on the video, not in the chat room, love to have you in there. Bottom left-hand corner, log in, choose the guest account, then put your name in where it says guest and hit submit. Love to have you in there and love to have your questions during the program. If you're listening to the recorded version or have questions about custom strengths coaching solutions for small, medium, large organizations, send us an email, coaching at gallup.com or use the contact form right there on the live page. That works for Q12 questions as well if you want to send that to us, coaching at gallup.com. Don't forget to visit the Gallup Strength Center, just gallupstrengthcenter.com for all your Clifton Strengths coaching resources and training needs. You can also catch the video on both streaming and downloadable audio for offline listening. It's available on our coaches blog. Just head out to coaching gallup.com and you may also want to reference during this series our q12 site so q12.gallup.com we try not to make that too hard but q12.gallup.com mike mcdonald is our host today mike works as a senior workplace consultant here on the gallup riverfront i get to see mike all the time although he travels quite a bit and so mike it's good to have you here in town that's why we're doing this on a monday but welcome to another call to coach yeah thanks jim uh and thanks everybody for making monday happen that's that's a uh, that can be a trick that can yeah. be a trick. And no, so, good um, good audience for, yeah. for, for Monday afternoon. I, it's because it's great content, Mike, and you're going to bring it, right? Yeah. So no no pressure on that. Well, it's we great are, content. Good, good, to ha- yeah, good to have you here. Yeah. We are going to cover Q1 today, which is I know it's expected of me at work, and we're going to give the audience the same expectations going forward. We kind of have some standard things that we're going to cover up front and all these is before we dive into the questions. So, Mike, why don't you get us kicked off with some of those expectations? Where are we going? What are we going to do? Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, Jim, as, as we've established in the first call, we, we really do want to continue this outline of empirical, emotional, experiential. Empirical, we want to give you enough research background so that you know what's true, you can stand on Gallup research, but also that you can leverage those, those uh, research points as perhaps bait as areas of attention. Uh, depending on the audience that you're speaking to or the individual you're speaking to. We do want to make sure that we do not miss the the heart and soul of engagement, which is the emotional, that uh, 70% of our behavior is is guided, governed, and motivated by what's emotional to us as we extend voluntary discretionary effort. And the experiential, that as we go through our discussions, that there's certain points in time where we share stories, or, and certainly I've I've tried to bring some stories and case studies and examples that really connect us to those experiences in our own life where that element of engagement was on for us or off for us. And so that we have a personal connection back to that. And I think that's that's really powerful and important as part of our coaching, not that we uh, reveal that much of ourselves necessarily when we're coaching and in terms of using our own examples um, in front of somebody that we're coaching, but, but at least that we can connect to that emotion that we experienced when we went through those highs and lows points around uh, that particular element of engagement. I think when we're coaching, that really creates that relationship-driven connection that's so important. So we do want to keep that outline of those three in front of us. Um, the other thing that we want to make sure that we do is continue to broaden and build on the resources that are available to you. And so part of what's really been exciting about the anticipation of this conversation and the, those that will follow is that we can continue to really integrate Gallup's best practice uh, research, but also application. And that Gallup's done a really comprehensive and exhaustive job of, of bringing in so many different stories and examples, uh, again, that give us tremendous options and solutions that we can really, again, use as we coach and, and work with those individuals who need our help to, to drive performance. And so uh, I, I, I've thrown in a couple extra um, this time as we continue, again, to broaden and build out that focus on resources and how we use those. But the first one that we really want to highlight, probably as centrally as any other, I think, as we go through these, these conversations, uh, is our first Break All the Rules uh, book that, that was um, uh released in the late 90s, around 1998, 99, and uh, in its original format. Now, one thing I do want to caution you, there is there is two uh, editions. You want to get the most recent that just came out here in uh, about three years ago. Um, and there's a 
two two primary reasons why you want to get that most recent recent copy. One is uh, embedded within that first break all the rules book is a strengths finder code. Uh, you all know about that, and so uh, tremendous value just right out of the gate in terms of what that code represents. But then what's really unique about that book is there is a code where up to ten people have access to and can take the Q12, answer the, tw the 12 items that we're talking through in our series, and it, and that leader would get a report uh, based on the results and the answers of uh, those people who participated in that particular administration. So just imagine you're coaching somebody, and in that instant connection, you are able to provide them with self-awareness around their top five strengths through your coaching, but targeted and aimed towards the engagement of the group that they're leading or representing. And what a powerful outcome um, and mechanism to be uh, held to be holding up as a backdrop, to be targeting the best of what that person has, their talent, their effort, all towards the drive and, and production of engagement. And so a real great package that you have there. And first break all the rules in and of itself is a seminal work uh, that really brings together uh, the background around our discovery and invention of the Q12 elements. Uh, but also some some context around what the world's greatest managers do as they drive those elements. And so you just got that all in your possession through that one book, uh, Mike, Jim. I I heard somebody Jim, this from somebody this week who said they're going to use it from our from our webcast last week. Like I'm going to buy the book. I've got a manager. I'm going to give it to them, and I'm going to help administrate. And they have a team of seven. This mm -hmm. would be perfect, right? Mm -hmm. Be able cool. to administrate that. And yet I do teams of fifty. Uh, at, in university settings, and it works just fine that way, yeah, right? Yeah. You can so it doesn't have to be for small teams; it can be for big teams. And we get the inside the tool. You have the ability to take big teams and make them smaller, so mm -hmm. you can identify this team as team A and this time as team B, and you can set those. And they can select those teams when they go in there to take the assessments. So, pretty nice whether it's a team of ten or a team of fifty or a team of five hundred or five thousand. Uh, we've got all the tools that are available to be able to make um, that happen um, as well. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, yeah. but you're right. It's you know, it's 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 funny because sometimes, Jim, I think the danger of that particular book is some people look at, at look at it as a starter kit, and that's a total disservice. That the the book is infinitely more than a starter kit. It's a powerful introduction, I will say that, but it's it's not a starter kit. The one thing too, Jim, that that I think is a unique snap on to this is uh, Gallup has has just released its um, Born to Build book that just came out recently. And when you think about a, a business builder bundle, if I can sequence those words together, uh, think, about, think about the coaching span that's available to you as you have a client of yours take that entrepreneurial assessment that's represented in the Born to Build book. And so you've got that overarching layer of understanding and ability. And then you bring that down to another level of detail and understanding in terms of how they drive their entre entrepreneurial ability through their own strengths, their top five strengths, but then always with the context of creating and driving and building a business through a culture of engagement and the people they lead. So some real opportunities, I think, to get, again, broad and powerful in, in how you aim your own capacity as a coach and the resources that we that we have out in front of us and how we use those. The other book that I'll be um, referencing throughout our discussion today is um, 12, The Elements of Great Managing. Uh, 12 uh, is a phenomenal uh, book that was a follow-up to First Break All the Rules. It has uh, literally a global and exhaustive qualitative study of uh, the world's greatest leaders as they act upon each of these 12 elements. So you'll literally hear uh, stories from the field around what's happened across every corner of the globe in a variety of environments, industries, and teams to drive in a best practice fashion at one particular element of engagement. So there's a lot of learning and takeaway there. And then the, uh, the other standby is our State of the American Workplace Report. And so there's going to be some references to that uh, recent report and the study, the keynote studies and findings that have been produced from that. So, and then, so a couple teasers or a couple uh, add-ons that I'm going to be referencing for today's conversation is Gallup's Millennial Report. So if you haven't familiarized yourself with that, uh, millennials will represent 70% of our workforce estimated uh, coming soon to a theater near you in about 2020, the year 2020. So if you haven't noticed, um, that powerful and impressive workforce uh, is, is really marching forward and um, brings different conditions, right? The world is changing, the workplace is changing. And, and so we have a lot of opportunity, I think, in what's represented um, to understand through our millennial report and in our own performance management paper. Um, thinking more about traditional performance management and how it's not keeping up 
with the changing world and workplace that we're part of and, and how do we tell the future through what the, what the research uh, provides us in terms of what the American and global workforce needs in terms of driving performance development. So we're going to integrate those into our conversation today as well. Mike, those resources available for the books, shop.gallup.com. Most you can find on Amazon in your market as well. And then the, all the reports are on gallup.com. So just go to gallup.com, search State of the American Workplace. Don't be fooled by the title of that, by the way. Yes, it was a study in, of American workplaces, but there are some great nuggets of just human nature in buried inside of that thing. So if you haven't if you haven't um, gone out there and downloaded it to use it, some pretty amazing stuff um, that's out there. So you can grab all that stuff out of gallup.com. All right, Mike, when we think about, I know it's expected of me at work, right? Let's dig in a little bit and first do an introduction. And let's, let's talk about some of the challenges we have with this because we said last week, when you don't get this one right, it's hard to get the other 11 to work for you. Mm -hmm. And so this is really foundational. Like today is pay attention, don't miss this session. You gotta get this one right. And so when you're in organizations, if you're if you're working in an area where they don't know what's expected of them, it's really hard to walk when your feet are missing. So let's have let's let's walk through that a little bit, Mike. What's our introduction to it? Absolutely. So I know what's expected of me at work. Uh, it's a trick. It's it's a trick. Watch out for it because it looks really straightforward. Uh, dare I even say transactional right out of the gate? And uh, the best of us, maybe all of us, have fallen for it at one point in time, either directly or indirectly, um, depending on how aware we were of this particular item and what it represents. But right out of the gate, uh, Jim, to your point, it's it's number one for a reason. And um, But as seemingly simple as it is on the surface, half the planet fails to deliver on an ability to strongly agree that they know it's expected of them at work. And I just think about the compromise uh, or that, ero that um, eroded foundation um, that, that really um, prevents us from anything happening on the other side. You know, I think about the psychology of what that existence must look like uh, a, a day spent where you're not sure of what your expectations are. I think it's a day spent in hiding, Jim. I think it's people, you know, lurking in the shadows and hiding around the corner, literally just trying not to get caught for that entire day. And I guess I would assume that just imagine uh, perhaps a year of that or a career of not knowing what you're expected to do, but the mounting pressure of operating under that awareness that you don't know what you're you know what you're uh, that that you don't know what you're supposed to do. Maybe other people have that assumption, but it becomes this cat and mouse game, right? Um, where you're literally trying to survive, let alone succeed. And so I think there's uh, a lot at stake, right? That we should not underestimate. Now, one particular item, um, the the center of it. If we were to look at the motivational need behind, I know it's expected of me at work. It's a need and a request to focus me. Make sense out of my world. Help me reprioritize when things shift, uh, when things um, uh, take a sidestep. Uh, help me, help me anticipate. Keep me agile, but help me. Don't, don't, don't put that all on me. But help me co-create exactly what those priorities are supposed to be, and stay in step and in sync. And there's a lot that's expressed when we do that well and when we do that right. So I think it's important for us to, to jump on in and, and really mind the depths of what exactly that looks like. What it is done well and when it is not. And so the, uh, if, we, if we look at the, some of the, the first things right out of the gate in terms of what is happening when we miss the mark on question number one, um, and, and you guys can just think in your own minds, when has this been active for you? When, it has, when has it been inactive uh, as well? And so it's, just see if there's any familiar thoughts around when this misses the mark. So the, some of the first kind of reactions to missing the mark on question number one is we're not clear on or we don't like the direction the organization is headed. So like this is a tone right now of this isn't just me checking out boxes and transactionally moving the cog in the machine forward or standing on an assembly line, but I need to have a perspective organizationally about what's going on and how do I connect to that. Uh, there is part of it though that we're not clear on our day-to-day -day responsibility. So how does that translate into what I'm supposed to do today? Not next week, not next month, but how does the accumulation of me knowing what I'm supposed to do each day actually matter and how I feel and my ability to rate that item? Here's, here's maybe if you want to, I don't know, again, if you're, if you're actually writing things down, um, to me, as, as my own experience with my teams that I've led throughout my career, and Jim, maybe this, you, you share in this, I think there's uh, this next one might get the marquee. Um, we receive multiple or conflicting instructions 
from different managers. And I think in the increasingly fast moving, um, increasingly dynamic nature of the workplace, and we'll talk more about this uh, later on in our call today, but when you think about specifically matrix, matrix teams and matrix work environment, remote teams, um, think about onboarding, think about the, the almost assault of information that there is now in inside an organization and the different sources of information. And they're very well intended, but particularly think about matrix teams where there's different project managers, different people who lead the team formally and how many disconnects there can possibly be in the dissemination of information. So I think that one deserves an asterisk. Um, and here's another when we think about the onboarding or alignment perspective is we get hired to do one thing, but get, ironically enough, actually get recognized or rewarded for doing something else. And so just think about the mixed message or signal there where it's like, well, I got hired for this, um, but I'm actually doing something else. But ironically enough, I'm getting rewarded for that, which in a weird way actually takes me away from that original space and place that I was hired to occupy. And so there's just a, there's just a lot of disconnects there. And, and again, they can be well-intended deliveries, but they don't quite land if we don't do things right. And I think that's where we have the opportunity to explore and, and uh, make those connections. Jim, I've got a couple nuggets of data that I think help reinforce uh, just how, how far off the mark we are. So um, when we reference our performance management paper and our state of the workplace paper, one of the things that we came to, I guess, surprisingly uh, see in context around this item is the fact that just 41% of employees strongly agree that their job description aligns with the work they're asked to do. 41%. Job description aligns with the work that they are asked to do. So, and maybe, maybe some of us are familiar with that or experiencing that now. Um, only 43% would actually even agree that they have a clear job description. So even just right out of the gate, there's just, there's some probably assumed opportunities that we think are really, really strong and intact, um, but we're missing the mark on, on those. When we think about expectations, um, there's a real gap in terms of how the workplace is assessing its onboarding. And only 12% of the United States workplace would say that their company do, does a great job of onboarding new employees. 12% say that's a great job uh, or that there's a great job being done in terms of onboarding. So there's a ton of opportunity. And, and I think it's, it's, it's it, the intensity around the need for this one particular element is so loud and so clear. One that I think we're gonna have to rely on over and over and over again. Um, again, our state of the workplace report brings to, to, to blush the, this notion of how dynamic the workplace is, particularly again, through the matrix teams and the remote teams. And again, we see this story um, on display in our data, 84% say that they are part of a matrix team to some extent, 84%. Uh, that was a real surprising find, I think, that came out of our report. So there's a real opportunity there for frequency of reestablishing those priorities, uh, a consistency around an expectation of where the sources of information comes from and who and why around those matrix teams. And then also think about our remote worker population, that 43% of our workplace is remote right now. So, Jim, there's a lot of moving parts and levers, uh, a lot of different features to our workplace that causes us to have to, to shift and to uh, shape and, and recraft exactly expectations. Mike, it's, it's interesting when we think about this, you talked about onboarding, and I, and I think this is where you need to set the expectations from the start. And, and that, it's actually the hardest. So oftentimes we generate, especially in recruiting, we generate a ton of activity around finding people and wooing them into the organization and getting them to sign the offer letter and we move them or they come in and there's first day and they sit down and those hiring managers have not really done their homework to make sure that that expectation of from day one is very, very clear. And so it, it, it really, knowing what's expected of me kind of starts on that day one, but you would be surprised that six months later, our data shows yeah. how many are still struggling in that area. And so this is like the power of this. We, we got to remember, right? We talk a lot about this as daily management practices. It's kind of the way it's written in our book, but you, sometimes you can't tell unless you sit down and you get everybody to take this assessment at the same time, right? Yeah. There's some, there's a lot of power in that too, of kind of getting a read. How, it, how are people doing? How are they feeling right now about it? And then I think the power, Mike, and maybe you can talk a little bit about this just kind of ad hoc in you know, you're in a group setting and everybody's seeing how everybody else is feeling, 
right? And it opens up the dialogue for some communication, especially in this area, you know, where they can kind of say, I don't know, like, you know what? I've been here six months and I'm still a little unclear. Mm -hmm. That's not a normal conversation. That doesn't happen unless you have a manager or someone saying, do you really know what's expected of you? I mean, kind of, kind of re, re, respond to that a little bit. Yeah, no, you're, you're right on point, Jim. One of the things that I think is, uh, that works so well, again, with the 12, the 12 items and our roles as coaches is we get to reposition those items as questions, right? So think about this, think about the fact, um, think about our typical uh, approach towards coaching someone. The first thing we do is establish a relationship and then start to sort through and level set. What are our expectations of each other in this dynamic and in this exchange? So I love that modeling effect that we have in our own coaching as we connect to those team leaders, those managers that we're working with, knowing that we're setting an example and we're helping to educate them on how they can then go on and lead and have those conversations with each other. Uh, so I think there's a real opportunity there. Uh, and I think the, the thing that comes... Um, to light, I think, in that exchange is the fact that it's really hard to ask, do you know it's expected often enough? Like almost daily, you could, you could ask that question or to reset or recalibrate to make sure that there's a confidence level about that. And that's a really safe place. Think how much confidence and authority and certainty there is in that relationship if we actually can strongly agree to that question that we really are uh, intact and standing on um, an ability to answer that question because it's not just answered for ourselves and we'll talk about this in some of our case studies but but when we can answer it well for ourselves that confidence level transmits when we're engaged ourselves we're able to help others have clarity about what they're able to do we have bandwidth to extend ourselves so that they know what questions they should ask to find out those right answers so that they're aligned around that, that particular item. Jim, one of the things that, that sticks out, I think that really reinforces that point is going back to our millennials and what we came to understand in that particular report. And one of the key findings that I, that I jotted down that I thought really stuck out to highlight this whole notion of prioritization and what priority feels like when you're newer to a workplace or to the workforce relative to having been here for a while is uh, when we look at our millennial population, only 54% of millennials say that they know how to prioritize their responsibilities at work. So just a little north of 50% of millennials can say that they know how to prioritize their responsibilities at work. But when we look at all the other generations that are represented in the workplace, 71% of the non-millennial generations do know how to prioritize their expectations and responsibilities at work. And so you can see to your to the point that you're making, there's just a different dynamic. It's it's, it's, it's acknowledging that priorities or knowing what's expected is different for us at different stages of tenure and experience. And for some of those, uh, some of us, it, it comes from experience, but for some of us and what we do, if we, if we really do this well, it comes from our culture. It comes from those coaching conversations that our managers are having. And so just being new isn't an excuse for our managers to underestimate the, the nature of what that prioritization looks like. Here's where it gets really interesting coming out of that notion around the millennials is that for those millennials who are engaged, almost 70% say that their manager helps them establish priorities. So right now we've got a call to action in our coaching with those team leaders, with those managers, get with your people. Don't ever assume that that question is a yes or it's a five just because you've told people what to do or just because they have the job outline perfectly sketched out um, onto their onboarding workbook. Uh, there's, a, there's that proximity back to manager and that sense making and that coaching relationship. Uh, it wins every time, um, but we have to be intentional and make the space for it to happen. Mike, sometimes we have to remember these, this generation is probably the most told generation. They've been told what to do. They have school systems that, that guide them along the way. Here in the state of Nebraska, you know, we test to the ACT now, which is getting really, really common in a lot of, in a lot of the states here in the United States. Um, I can't speak for other cultures uh, outside of the United States, but I think it's a good example of, so they're, they're testing the, all their teaching. It's all leading to very specific outcomes. And so it's very, very clear oftentimes in the classroom. It's very, very clear. I struggle with this all the time in our, in our interns because they're used to being kind of told on a daily basis. They also have, a we have an incredibly engaged set of parents who are managers, they're managers who are constantly in a lot of cases, and not in all cases, by the way, this is just kind of a subset of that group, but who's telling them. And so, you know, what to do and how to do it. They're very engaged managers in managing their children's lives. 
and they get into the workforce and it's not what we're finding in the numbers are they're landing here. And I think today's managers are kind of, by the way, we've kind of been told they want loose and open schedules and flex time and all those things are important to them. So you bring them in and you're like, hey, I thought you could figure this out and we're not going to dictate any time, even though that's everything you've ever known getting here, right? Yeah. And all of a sudden it's this, this, just this clash of expectations. And um, I spent a full two weeks every day asking our interns, do you know what's expected of you today? Like, that's how I left meetings. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, we're done. What's expected of you? Yeah. And it was just kind of setting that tone for that. So I made sure. And then as days progress, you can do less and less management right at that point. But it's that, it's that spot check of, do you know what's expected of you? We've, my, all my stuff's anecdotal. We actually did some case studies though. So yeah. let's, yeah. let's dig in a little bit that don't let my data skew it. It's probably not true anyways, but let's, uh, let's dig in a little bit on that research. Jim, you're reinforcing things beautifully. Keep going. But the, uh, the, uh, the, the one thing that, st- that stands out to me, and I think this is a, a great positioning for this one item, is we think about our own coaching or we think about managers who, who lead as a coach. We really do. It's, it's creating and converting these, these elements into conversations, right? Uh, into conversations that actually make it okay to ask questions of each other. And that by itself becomes an expectation. And so, Jim, I get really excited when I think about your own case study with our interim program that you're creating an environment where part of the expectation is if you really don't know the answer, it's perfectly okay for you to ask. I'm going to continue to ask you, but by all means, don't wait for me to ask you as well. And so I it really, uh, one of the things that we know is that, that great goal setting, great alignment, it has to be clear, collaborative, and aligned, clear, collaborative, and aligned. And Jim, you, what you're describing is that collaborative piece where together, we created a spot where it is expected for me to ask questions. And I hear a lot of really, to me as a managerial best practice, but a lot of managers with new people on their team uh, for a standing agenda item, they'll say, Hey, we're going to meet every Friday. Every Friday, I want you to have 10 questions for me. It will help you do your job better. And I think that's just a, a, a very powerful, but very practical way just to make sure that that conversation, uh, that expectation clarity is always alive um, it can acknowledge being dynamic, but is the appetite or the change or the shift for that new person um, takes on a new direction, they're still in a great spot to to be in tune with exactly what are they supposed to be doing. And it's a powerful conversation, obviously, with their manager in that regard. And speaking of case studies, there was um, some of our own, as, as again, as we look around the world and, and the varieties of people and outcomes that have been delivered through each of these elements that we, we have the opportunity to really uh, process through um, a hero in, in one of our, uh, in, in our 12 elements book. And, and uh, the hero in this story is Nancy Sorrell. Nancy is a hotel property manager and she was really highlighted and featured in uh, the element um, that we're discussing today. I know it's expected of me at work. And Nancy uh, is considered to be quite a savant when it comes to the expertise and delivery uh, the clarity and the foundation of knowing what's expected. Uh, one of her, one of her um, uh, superiors, when they when they recruited Nancy to come to uh, her current hotel, uh, what they noticed about her, and this is a qualitative reaction from this from this director, was that every supervisor knew their goal in every numeric category and knew how they were going to get there. So. As we unfold this conversation about knows what's expected, it's not just knowing what you're supposed to do, but also how exactly you're supposed to do that. And there's more nuances to that that we'll add on to it as well. But this this director said literally the clarity she provided uh, for her hotels, for her teams, almost brought them to tears. And so you can see that there's a, a desire, right, in terms of what that represents and how desperate we can be for that type of clarity. One of the things that you're going to hear in Nancy's story is, in, in, as she tells it and, and we walk through the case study, uh, you'll hear some familiarity, I think, about where expectations misses the mark. And here's just some key takeaways and some listen fors that you can uh, pay attention to as you're jotting these down. But uh, one is that there are too many incentives for people to do routine things. In this hotel that, that Nancy took over, um, uh, people were being focused on the steps but not the outcomes and actually not just a focus, but even a pay system and structure had been set up to focus more on the steps of delivery than actually the arrival of any particular outcomes. And so in place of real um, 
meaningful a pay, um, more outcome incentive based pay, uh, there was a, a, a small accumulation of process based rewards. And so she had to go in and rewire that. And as you can imagine, now think, think about this, think about the leadership for her that's required to step into this scenario and rewire, rewire this whole system that's set around pay. Uh, one of the most sensitive topics and issues that we can start to, to move and to reposition it in ways that will stretch the capacity and the talent and the performance of a team, but in the in doing so, we'll make it right. It will align it with what's necessary for that organization to be sustainable and moving forward. Um, one of the biggest takeaways, I think, is a lesson for all of us that we learned from Nancy in her case study. Uh, she describes in this journey how she was we, she was approaching things at a pretty steady uh, piece by piece, piecemeal approach. But at one point in time, she had this epiphany and somebody on her team said, you know, I, I like you and I would, I would, I think I want to follow you. I'm just not sure where you're going. And I think there's a key takeaway there in, in, in that statement that as we're assessing and describing and establishing clarity and, and priorities and, um, a focus for the people on our teams, it's not just getting the job done, right? It's not even necessarily just how do we get the job done, but where does this all go? Where, and, and, and am I the one taking you there and is it right? And have I made that clear for you? So Nancy's takeaway was um, if they don't know where they're going, then that's the litmus test for me and my establishment of this particular item. Uh, and so Nancy went back and recorrected and calibrated around that futuristic perspective of, do I know what's expected of me at work and where does that actually roll up and take us collectively? Uh, the, the impact on her organization or on her hotel was profound. Um, when Nancy showed up their their inspection score, uh, based on the criteria and ranking of excellence that the, that the hotel was graded on, they were a 59 out of 100. And so they had their work cut out for them. That was, that was certainly not best practice. Nine months later, uh, as Nancy tells the story and as we look at it through our case study, they arrived at a score of 95 out of 100. And all of this is oriented around a focal, focal point of knows what's expected of me at work. Um, and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't just impact us locally or at the individual level. Uh, one of the things that um, they were looking at, and it was really deceptive. Again, this is where this, this item becomes really tricky. On the outset, uh, when you just looked at this property, it was really well done. It was a new property. Everybody that was hired and working within it seemingly were going around their work and doing it well. Um, there was there just wasn't anything at the at the naked eye that really would explain why it was underperforming, and it was underperforming at that time. Before Nancy showed up, it was one point five million dollars behind budget on revenue. Uh, so there was just an empirical story, again empirical, that we had to pay attention to to understand what exactly isn't going on there. Nancy goes in, recalibrates around this notion of knows what's expected, and. Uh, at that point of success that she brought them to later on, they're operating at a rate of $500,000 ahead of their budget on revenue goal. So Jim, right off, right, right out of the gate, we have a, a great story with a lot of threads to it that we can pull out and extract and think about how we coach to leaders in a way that has them call the right plays for their teams. Yeah, and, and I think we have to remember this, this first question really speaks to the leader more than anybody else. It's, it would be tough for individual contributors to step in and, and fix this on a team, right? You, you, the leader really takes the initiative, really drives this forward. It's coaching as coaches. I think we have the ability inside organizations when we reach those leaders to have this amazing impact that it, yes, it, like individual coaching is needed and people need to have that top five and those strengths discovery sessions. That's a minimum, right? Those kind of things have to happen. But the exponential growth and the financial growth, I think really happens and we see this in these examples it happens at this at the manager level. And when a manager is getting it right and setting the expectations and setting the pace, setting the tone, it can really change an organization. And I, and I think that's littered throughout that case study. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah, Jim, I think, uh, again, as we think about ourselves as coaches, and again, with all these elements, but uh, I think um, a great way to lead into that coaching conversation, knowing what we know about engagement, and, and as we discuss item number one, uh, is asking that manager. How confident do they feel in their own expectations, their own leadership with their team? Are there things they need to be more clear about? And as performance coaches, are we able to help them assemble what that conversation could look like uh, as they connect back to um, their boss, to their superior, uh, to their manager, and ask them the right questions to reestablish that, that clarity and confidence? Uh, one of the things that has 
always amazed me. It's it's such a powerful uh, discovery and point of, of connective uh, research that I think really over over encompasses uh, all of our discussion around engagement is the fact that when leaders are categorically engaged, so if we think about the senior leaders of an organization, if they're categorically engaged, their managers, those leaders of teams who report to them are 39% more likely to be engaged. So for Jim and I, if our boss is categorically engaged, Jim and I are 39% more likely to be engaged ourselves. Now, Jim and I lead teams, and so our research extends itself, and what we found is, is that teams of categorically engaged managers are 59% more likely to be engaged. So just play out the connect the dots here. Jim and Mike's boss is engaged, that means Jim and Mike are 39% more likely to be engaged. And rather than that being diluted and the effect trailing off, it actually is amplified through the teams that Mike and Jim lead being 59% more likely to be engaged. So just think about the modeling effect and how necessary it is to make sure that in our coaching, we're making sure that we close those gaps, that that osmosis-driven modeling, uh, relationship-driven effect of knowing expectations is really well established for that manager we're working with, that leader we're working with, because if it's disconnected there, uh, we're gonna lose a really great opportunity to drive on down through the teams and, and truly create understanding and awareness around engagement and knows what's expected. It's, it's an enormous impact. And you, I think coaches have a great opportunity as they're coaching leaders to have that. You, you just highlighted it with numbers. I said it earlier, uh, very anecdotal. You said it with numbers that uh, really make a difference. And the great thing is, organizations can manage that and measure that on their own. So they can begin to look at big teams and start saying, start rolling up that engagement and, and to find those pockets where it's done really well yeah. and then begin to celebrate those areas. I think sometimes there's a, a tendency to, for, for the, you know, for the, uh, the witch hunt, so to speak in an organization, let's race to the bottom. Like let's take this thing and then we're going to find the managers, right? And, and right. you know what? Managers who have low engagement, it needs to be addressed. Not, not saying that. But it does give us the ability to sort in the big setting and then be able to start celebrating like, hey, what's going right? Like, why is Mike so successful and Jim's teams are not engaged at all? Why is that? That's an important discussion to have, right? And it's that's a lot easier done when, when everybody's taking the same assessment and they're yeah. right, you, you, you've, you've got those measurements. So yeah. works out super cool. Mike, let's, let's do one more of those. I'll let you pick. We had three ready. You pick, yeah. you pick one of the two. Yeah. Well, Jim, you, you, uh, I'm going to take your cue cause you took us into a, a really great connection to, to one of these, you know, that point about being a, a winch head is where we, when we look at teams that are doing well versus those that are not right. A lot of times we think, well, we'll just subtract that out. Uh, and certainly if we replace it with better talent, that by itself will cause us to win. And there's some really fascinating, uh, again, examination of, is that true? It, it will talent trump uh, lack of clarity, lack of expectations and our ability to win? And, and so this is where I think it really gets exciting. This is where you see the dynamic of a team and that team level interpretation and expression of engagement is when we take an item that seems to be singularly and individually focused, like I know it's expected of me at work, but in reality, it's connected out through and to our team. And so what happens there as our team leaders do all the right things so that that's a, a cultural effect that we all are held accountable and explain for each other. Uh, one of the terms that's that's been referenced in, in I, I think uh, is important for us because it's it's got such a color commentary to it, but it's, it's called collaborative elasticity. So think about that point of reference as we, as we think about our coaching, but, but as a reference point for our team leaders, what kind of collaborative elasticity, what kind of give and take is there in our mutual understanding about knowing expectations? And how do we create that as a team leader? And when we think about that, that term, uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of discovery opportunity for us to, to press into. So I want to take us on into that. And I'm going to use sports as an example. So one of the, one of the research studies that, that uh, was used to highlight this, this element of well-being um, was a study that was conducted in the NBA, the National Basketball Association. And some, out of curiosity, some management professors took a look at some data uh, across NBA statistics. And they looked at 23 teams 
from the years 1980 to 1994, almost 15 years worth of data. And what they were really looking at, is there anything to this collaborative, this notion of collaborative elasticity in terms of the tenure, the collective tenure and staying power, uh, the consistency of that team that would explain success in terms of wins and losses. And so they followed through to, to mine through the data and see if exactly that was the, the story to be told. But one of the things that they really brought out in that case study that I think, again, is important for us as references to, to use in our coaching is think about, again, in this sports metaphor, there's a playbook, right? Those basketball teams all had a playbook with X's and O's and very tightly scripted plays, a lot of detail and, and uh, no stone left unturned in terms of how clear the instructions were about how to run an offense or what a defensive set looked like. Not that much different than any organization in terms of policies, procedures, assembly manuals, protocols, et cetera, that we operate from. And the, the reference point there is that's explicit knowledge. That's just, here's your manual, here's the plays, go memorize those, explicit knowledge. But the power in really unleashing expectations and this mutual interpretation and this culture uh, of, of application around uh, knowing expectations and supplying the answer to that for each other really comes from a point of reference called tacit knowledge. And tacit knowledge is where it's not that Jim and Mike just know what the rules are and how they're structurally or systematically supposed to work together, but now it's Mike and Jim having a personality understanding, a relationship understanding, and uh, a sequence and a cadence of setting those expectations and meeting those expectations for each other that doesn't get captured in the X's and O's. It doesn't get captured in our training, our formal training or our policy manual or procedure manual. That just comes from Jim and Mike working together, from Jim and Mike having the right conversations at the right time in ways that mean um, the importance of clarity and confidence around those expectations. And so it takes that at any level, whether it's an NBA team, whether it's uh, a hospital operating room, whether it's the workplace, there's no replacement for that clarity and, and that relational proximity, that, that shared understanding and the delivery of that item. And so what we can do now, though, is at our, at our advantage and what we have at our disposal is the ability to coach into that, right? We have Strengths Finder. We have a framework of engagement and we know all the right buttons to push how to accelerate the speed that Mike and Jim come together as a power of two partnership, uh, creating that mutual understanding, supplying answers and the right questions for each other. And so as we play that on out, if you think about that tacit knowledge, how do we help teams accumulate and arrive at that tacit knowledge? And where would we ask if we were to describe that nuanced relationship driven expression to a team leader? How, what would they say? What would they say the best of their team's ability is in that shared understanding? Or would they be able to identify gaps? And your coach, you can help that team leader structurally fill those gaps in as a result. But Jim, the, 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 the some statement to all of this was, is that in a very significant fashion, those teams that had uh, the most collective tenure, the least turnover, um, i.e. the most staying power as a team, had a significant difference in terms of wins and losses. Uh, and so when you back that out, when you think about that nuanced, tacit knowledge approach that they had towards their success and that that repetition that they had playing with each other, um, there's a lot there for us to learn out of that one single case study. So I'll I'll let you react to that. Now, I think sports is always a good, it's a good way to look at it. It's certainly a small microcosm of what the workplace looks like because its pressures are a little bit different. Not all that much different in a lot of ways. We are going through a big coaching change here in the state of Nebraska as we think about our football team right. that we're going to put on the field here in the fall. And it will be interesting. We've gone through two coaches that uh, if we, they were the manager, have not necessarily shown that great of success in getting their players to know what's expected of them. And if you play football in the state of Nebraska, the expectation is that you win, right? Yeah. That's our state's expectation. Um, oh, we have a new coach that's made it very, very clear. He understands that. And we'll see. The results are coming out, you know, um, on that management. But, you know, where those physical, tangible resorts on, a, on, a, on the football field or on the basketball court or whatever, baseball, cricket, soccer, what's going on right now, the World Cup is going on right now in soccer, is easy. But, Mike, when we think about that on in, you know, the rest of the world, 99.999% of the coaches slash managers live in a world where widgets need to get completed or code, software code needs to get written 
or floors need to get swept or, you know, fill in the blank, right? When we think about some of the challenges that they face with that, going into that, what what are some of those for managers? Would you give, can you walk me through a little bit of that? What, what, what kind of hope or tips can you give in that area? Yeah. Yeah. Fortunately, we have, uh, we have some insight and I'm going to refer to uh, first break all the rules uh, as, as you all think about where some of this comes from. That's a, that's a great place to start, but there's a great outline of understanding in terms of what what the challenges are, maybe some of the temptations that we fall into as we lead teams, but then fortunately at the end of the story, best practices that help us navigate uh, those challenges and deliver on the clarity of, of knows what's expected um, really well. The, the, the trick I think for most managers really comes to, to bear where it's, it's that tension between managers needing to have control and there is some level of control, right? Some discipline, some definition to what it is we're expected to do and how we do it. But then finding the, the, the space for that person to still be a person, for emotions to still uh, create our best outcomes. And so it's that loose, tight combination that has challenged most leaders to really deliver. And when pressed, we typically move to our most conservative stance. We move to our most... Uh, resistant, rigid stance um, out of risk management, which is a little bit of that fight or flight mentality, right? So um, we may just freeze, uh, maybe out of necessity, but 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 there's a tension there that we can overcome and arrive at an optimized state around this item. But that's that's really what happens there, and and this is where what Nancy did is so smart in that in our previous case study, where Nancy went through and realigned pay and expectations towards outcomes. Now we've got a combination of tight expectations and, and a futuristic delivery, we, we know where Nancy's taking us, but by focusing on the outcomes and not on the steps or the tasks to get there, Nancy gives us the space for us to operate within our strengths, to not have a prescriptive predestined style of delivery that's judged as right or wrong, but we're allowed to use the best of our abilities to be that one in 33 million along the way and still be successful in our own stylistic preference that's different than Jim's, but we can both be great in, in different ways and arrive at the outcome that's been defined for us. And it works. And we see this in our research. The approach is very efficient. And what it really does, going back to the clear, collaborative and aligned, that collaborative piece where we create the space for a person to be themselves and just let instinct and their raw talent just convert itself to performance, uh, you see a higher level of responsibility. And so now when you think back to our definition of engagement, involved, enthusiastic, and committed, that commitment piece comes to light and now people follow through in a way that's emotional and irrational, but it's their word that's at stake. It's, their, it's the bond they have with the team that's at stake in their follow through. And so when we think about how that, how that works, the, the, the trap doors that we can avoid uh, there's a couple temptations uh, that, are, that are called out. The first is one where it, it's categorized as perfect people. And the perfect people is a reference to ourselves. We think we are perfect. We like to project. We assume that if it worked for us, it should work for everyone. And that by that statement, that there's a talent judgment that's on display there. That if um, that our teams may not have enough talent and if they're lacking in the talent and our judgment of talent is the fact that they're not like us is um, is that we'll just make up for it with more rules and we'll make up for that lack of talent with more regulation. And so that focus on outcomes really helps us avoid that trap door and, and our coaching helps avoid that self-awareness trap door that there's many, many roads to success and we, and we need to let that person's natural talent be guided uh, towards that outcome. The other is, is that it's trust is trust takes a while for us, right, to arrive at. And that a lot of our leadership, when somebody is new or a team is new in our work together, that trust may not have been established yet, may still be um, growing. And so we tend to overpopulate the lack of trust, again, with rules, procedure, protocol, et cetera. And so that's where that relational proximity that our coaching can create that that team leader as a coach can create when we think about the language of strengths and engagement, we can close those gaps and accelerate the rate of trust so that we're not tempted to overregulate our way towards outcomes. And then uh, there's also, then there's this pursuit of measurement that, that, and definition that sometimes the, the outcomes um, aren't as easy to find or to arrive or identify at. And so sometimes in the, in the struggle to, to produce those, then we just resort to steps. We resort to regulation. We resort to a task-oriented um, approach. And so don't give in to the involvement, the intentionality, the 
investment that takes to identify those outcomes because they're worth it. Uh, they're the North Star, so to speak, but that is another trap door that we can fall into. Now, let's let ourselves off the hook because I've talked about what could seem like a very organic um, and maybe a too loose of a way for us to arrive at success without taking reality into account. We do want to make sure that there are, there is some acknowledgement of some scenarios, right, where we do have to um, be mindful of exactly the, the regulation and the rigor that's, that's um, represented in certain industries. Um, so some of the rules of thumb as we think through that mindset, uh, the first of those would be categorized around this notion of don't break the bank. And that's just a, a catchy way of really putting an emphasis on certain industries like banking. Um, or hospitals or government where some of that protocol is necessary to protect people, to protect finances, to protect resources. And so uh, we don't, we, we have to acknowledge the structure that's inherent within the integrity of that delivery and what's represented in that industry. So, um, but whatever space we can create, whatever space we can identify, can we position those tasks and make sure that they're aligned going back to the best of that manager's coach, that they're clear, collaborative, and aligned, then making sure that those tasks are at least aligned with each other and towards those powerful outcomes that we are able to um, broadly represent and roll up to. The other is a notion around standards rule that certainly if not given a choice, uh, if there is a regulation or a protocol that's part of your law um, at, the, at the government level, um, then by all means, position ourselves around that and make sure that those steps are paramount. We're not, we're not promoting or proposing anarchy, Jim. We want to make sure that we're mindful of that. And so um, uh, acknowledging that where it's, where it's prevalent. The main thing there is just that acknowledging those, those structures as and when they're necessary, but not artificially creating those. That what we really want to do is create as much space as we possibly can within that. And then the third is not to let the creed, quote unquote, overshadow the message um, and just making sure that if those those steps are required, uh, that they don't overshadow the outcome, right? They don't become bigger than the outcome so that we could actually achieve a step, but have it come at the risk or expense or the ignorance of driving an actual outcome that matters. So what do the best do? Jim, the best, um, the best managers are resilient and tenacious about defining and discussing. The, the expectations. They don't ever assume. Through new people, through change management, they have a routine and cadence at the individual and team level where they're reviewing expectations. They also lift up best practice expectations. So part of their recognition, Q4, I've been recognizing the past seven days, are those best practice models of people who emulate the best of those expectations where they don't just deliver themselves perfectly, but they are influencing and affecting and supplying answers to questions for clarity to those, mem those team members. Alignment is a key. We talked about that. Clear, collaborative, and aligned, making sure that there's always a recalibration in that alignment and that those coaching conversations that team leaders ought to be having with the individuals and their teams ought to be constantly um, realigning and making sure that we're level set in our, our course correction. Uh, the collaborative part, that we're partnering with employees, not just in terms of telling them what the expectations are, but what a great conduit of insight to ask team members, what should our expectations be? Where do you think they ought to be? Where's, where's the most effective gauge of our success or progress and, and our clarity around that? Uh, inviting that, that team member into that discussion is incredibly powerful. Frequency matters. We know that the more touch points managers have, increases engagement. So when we think about the opportunity to level set and create a lot of accuracy around clarity and expectations, um, just more of those touch points matters. They don't have to be long and exhaustive, but expressing accountability and availability on the part of that team leader is a great way to drive best practice Q1 performance. And then last but not least, uh, Jim, we just, keep, we just have to keep going back to the drawing board. Um, as we assess performance and gauge progress towards it, part of our diagnostic needs to be, first and foremost, how clear are we collectively on our expectations? Mike, I, I, it's hard for me to not, you know, we talk about strengths and engagement and some of these things with talent. And there's some, uh, you know, some folks in the chat room kind of, you know, asking the question when those things get out of alignment or when we, when we have folks who are disengaged and we don't have them the right talent set. And we do have to remember, just a reminder, selection is a really important part of this as well as we're picking the right talent for the right job, doing the right thing. I think sometimes we make the assessment, we get really lucky here at Gallup because we practice very, very strict selection in our instruments when, before we hire people. And that's another part of the equation. We won't spend a lot more time think, talking or thinking about that now. But oftentimes as managers, 
if you have people misaligned and their talents are not lining up with the roles that they're doing, you got to start thinking about movement. How do we move them around? How do we refashion things? How do we find other places for them? Or maybe it's time to, to change organizations. Yeah. And, um, and so that talent piece is really hard. You can't force that square peg into a round hole. Yeah. You got to give them the opportunities. And if it's not working, sometimes you have to give them the opportunities to move on. Yeah. Um, move on and do something different that needs to, you know, that's a hard, that's a super hard, uh, super hard language to bring. But if we're not, if, if they're not aligned properly and they're not, they don't know what's expected of them, this gets really, really hard. And, uh, and it can, it, it flies apart really fast. If you're, it's hard to thrive when you're suffering. Mm -hmm. If you don't know if you're in the wrong role and you're not, you don't know what's expected. It gets really, really difficult to be thriving. Yeah. You know? I think it's hard to, and, and I think um, it's such a chicken and egg um, yeah. dynamic, right? But I, I do think if we, if we really to hold ourselves accountable, if half the planet isn't clear on what they're expected to do, I, I, I'm just going to speak manager now, and I implore all of you as coaches of team leaders and managers to be thinking through this lens. I guess I personally, I think we have to take that expectations piece off the table and make sure we've got that accounted for. Um, because we don't always have a, a span of, uh, or some line of sight into what's, what, what is going on from a talent perspective. But if we can squarely address that expectations piece, and then we've got an opportunity to really see where talent is sorting or not on the other side, I just think there's a call to action and accountability around, um, how well we're really delivering on yeah. that first time. Yeah. Engagement, you know? And if you're not measuring in any way today, there, there, you know, there's a cat had put a question, you know, she'd love to hear more about the pursuit of measurement. Mm -hmm. If you're not measuring anything today, this is a great way to get started. Like this is a 35 million people have gotten this measured. We got some pretty good stats around it. You don't have to work very hard to get it done, <laughs> right? Ask a few questions, compare them to the global database, right? Yeah. There's an easy way to get your measurement going and, and get some good stuff. Mike, in one minute, let's wrap this thing up. Tell yeah. us, there's, we've got some great, uh, some additional resources besides the ones we mentioned up front. Roll through those here real quick. Yeah, you bet. So uh, again, one of the, one of the uh, touchstones that Jim and I really want to drive as we think about extending our abilities as coaches, as performance coaches on into the, the framework of engagement. One course that, that really stands out um, is our engagement champions, creating an engaged workplace um, for champions course. It's a two-day course built around a train the trainer model. And what it does is it really unpacks the foundation and fundamentals of engagement, the science and application of engagement, but really understanding how you as a subject matter expert can co-pilot along with a team leader through coaching, through support, through guidance, through promotion and communication to really deliver best practice engagement for the teams that they lead. And so there's a great structure and strategy uh, around the resources involved around how you communicate a cadence and a cycle. It takes um, engagement and annualizes it so that there's a, a delivery to it and an expectation in that in that framework, uh, along with this with a prepackaged preloaded uh, PowerPoint decks, two PowerPoint decks, one that's 45 minutes long that's intended for any audience just to help communicate broadly what the fundamentals of engagement are. Uh, but another PowerPoint deck and accompanying materials that help you deliver uh, to an audience of managers, of team leaders, to help them understand from their own unique role as team leaders, how do they drive engagement for their team? The sessions are scalable. Uh, you, can, you can break them up. You can deliver them in, in their full intended versions, but an incredibly powerful way to you reach an audience and establish yourself as a performance coach through the framework and consulting and advice around engagement through that course. The second one that we really want to bring again um, and, and lift up to all of you is, is our leading high performing teams workshop. Again, that's a two day course, but in the structure of it, the first morning, the first half of the day is really spent around the notion and study and understanding of strengths through the perspective of the team leader as they think about leading their team through the power of strengths. The second half of that first day gets into the foundations of engagement, uh, the performance that's released through engagement, the second or the first part of the second day builds off of engagement more into getting into the application of it to drive performance. And in the second half of that second day takes us into five performance conversations that are the product of our performance management, performance development paper that we just came out with, if you want to check that out. But it helps those managers understand what are these five conversations, how do I use them, and how do, we, how do I establish a playbook where I can take advantage of the current structure 
that I'm working within and connect those conversations intentionally to drive the performance of my team. Many coaches have taken advantage of both those courses and have emerged on the other side, thinking team leader, thinking manager, speaking team leader and speaking manager. And it's really accentuated the power of the coaching that we bring to the table. Now, well, sounds good, Mike. And uh, we appreciate everyone who's got this far in the process and, and a lot of questions on that. If you've got additional questions about the courses or what's offered in them or the books or what Mike talked about, Mike, that performance management paper that you were talking about, can I just download that? Is that available at galp.com? What's the easiest way to find it? Do you think? Galp.com, just download it. Yeah. Okay. Great content, great thought leadership. Uh, really changed, honestly. It'll change the dynamic of your coaching, uh, but also the, the reality of team leaders to deliver engagement in a daily conversation with the people that they lead. Yeah. No, I think coaches, your greatest opportunity for impact is to impact leaders who will impact those that they manage. So mm -hmm. great opportunity. I also get the question, like I've taken ASC and I've taken the advanced course. What do I take next? Like, what's the next thing? This is the next thing, by the way. This is it. You should be, you if you're if you're wanting more, it's there. Well, we'll remind everyone to take full advantages of all the resources we have available at the Gallup Strength Center, just gallupstrengthcenter.com. You can find a list of those courses that we were talking about. If you want to go ahead and check those out, uh, full descriptions available for them, just go to courses.gallup.com, peruse through that, and uh, all that those descriptions are out there. Like I said, if you have questions, email us, coaching at gallup.com. If you want somebody to call you back, just mention that in a number, and we'll have uh, one of our inside learning folks give you a call back. You can catch the recorded version of this and all the past ones that we've done as well. Um, they're available in our sources resources page on our social resources page. Coaching, it's at the website coaching.gallup.com. Uh, if you want to join in the conversation on Facebook as well, you can do that. Facebook.com slash group slash call to coach. We'll get you there as well. If you found this helpful, we'd ask that you share it. We're looking forward to the next 11 of these as we dig them out. They'll be available for you. You might be just finding this series. We're going to, you're going to be like, great. Just go ahead and binge it right now. Get through all 11 of them right now. If you're staying around live, we appreciate you guys coming out live. With that, we'll say goodbye, everybody.